You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com on demand backslash a place at the table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, we're talking to John Spears. He has been called a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area during the days of hippies and rampant drug use, John was faced with some difficult life choices along the way. You said your father passed away when you were 15, and that sent you into a spiral. And not a good yeah, one. I don't, I don't, well, I didn't, I didn't spiral up. I didn't spiral down. I kind of, I was, I, I call it the, the ship without a rudder. Because in, instead of going in a straight line somewhere, I was starting to zigzag and float and just kind of uh, feel my way through this thing. And uh, I mean, I, I, I looked at my life several different ways. Um, I know who I am, and I know what my values are, but you can be seduced and really taken off track by your environment if you allow it to. Um, my, I had five younger brothers, mm. and uh, because I was older, I didn't hang out really too much with the younger cousins or brothers. And that was a godsend because one of our cousins led some of the other cousins into drug addiction. Wow. Three of my brothers were found alone. Well, the middle one, he had a roommate, the same thing. He woke up out of his sleep and uh, laid back down and died. Wow. The one that was on methadone uh -huh. was just, uh, that's a whole nother story. Yes, but, yes. But uh, then the other, four of them, died as a result of, of their childhood, where they started in childhood. Four of them died as a result at different stages of their life. Yes. I got three notices in the mail, city college, postal job, and the draft. Mm -hmm. So the draft superseded those other two when I went into the military and um, was really kind of, uh, I, was, I was saved in a way because I wasn't... Uh, out on the streets of San Francisco trying to find my way or being subjected to what was going on in the neighborhood, drugs and alcohol and a lot of other things. You know, my mother um, was trying to raise five boys by herself. We had a property there on the Visadero Street. Uh, she was not employed. My dad was working. He uh, injured his back. Uh, it's, everything's kind of vague. I think he was... Uh, I think he was a chef or something or cook at the Sheraton Palace Hotel. Mm. And in, slipped and injured his back. And then uh, wound up being a short order cook or something at TikTok Drive-In on 3rd Street near the Sanford, where the Giants ballpark is. Yeah. By that little, that little bridge there. Yeah. There was a TikTok Drive-In there. And I used to go down there to, to watch him work or meet him at work and eat. He'd always bring home all these day-old donuts, and we thought that was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> it was. That's <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, he'd bring home a dozen or two of those donuts, and we had a ball. But uh, so my mother kind of struggled, you know, and then she remarried. Mm -hmm. um, by that time, I was in the military and uh, went to uh, basic training in Seattle, advanced training, medical training in St. San Antonio, Texas, mm -hmm. and then on to Germany um, as a medic. Uh, so while I was, uh, I was at a medic unit in Hanau, Germany, we were in Frankfurt, and then they moved us to Hanau. Uh, 
which is like going from San Francisco to uh, Hayward or something. Yeah. San, San Francisco to San Jose, something like that. So I also went to radio teletype school and learned Morse code. They put me in a room uh, about the size of an average, I don't know, toilet, <laughs> closed the door, put headphones on me. <laughs> and I, I guess I learned discipline that way because I'm very comfortable sitting in a room alone by myself. <laughs> you know, I'm very comfortable. So that elevated me from uh, ambulance driver, the back of the line, to the very front of the line. As a radio teletype operator, I was the... Uh, the company commander's jeep driver and radio operator. So I went from a big nasty uh, radio teletype truck or uh, ambulance to a nice little jeep with two cool radios and two big antennas <laughs> hanging over the side. I was Mr. Cool. I stayed clean and starched all day. And then I took uh, I took a dare from this kid who dared me to go out for the football team with him. And so, first day of practice, I showed up. I get there, I get dressed and everything, and I'm looking around for him. Guess who's not there? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't. I, I practice with the team, and I've always been uh, athletic and, and coordinated and all that good stuff. So I made the team. Uh, I was a starting uh, tight end. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was on the kickoff team. We won our division championship and lost in the championship game. Uh, won a trip to uh, Garmisch, uh, Munich, Garmisch uh, for a weekend. They gave us for bringing uh, positive notoriety to the division. We got that free trip. You, were, you, and, you mentioned uh, a guy that somebody either in the military yeah, that, that, you, that changed your life. I met this guy, Ben Holder, from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, Ben was very suave, sophisticated, very intelligent. The German women loved him. And I said, that's the guy. I That's my man right there. I want to be Ben Holder. But I was a high school dropout. So the first thing I did is I went and got my GED while in the military. I, I, you know, I used Ben as, as a role model because I really didn't have any others. Came out and uh, really never set foot back in San Francisco. I came back, okay. uh, got out, uh, got into San Francisco State, went out for the freshman football team. Um, I went out, there was about five or six guys at wide receiver, you know, trying out. And I just kept going to practice. I didn't do anything any better than anybody else, but I just kept going back to practice. Next thing I know, there's only three of us there. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you made the team. And then, again, my, uh, my lack of the information and just awareness, I realized, I said, John, if you get hurt out here, how's that going to be paid for, son? <laughs> And these white boys, a lot of them, they came from good schools, had parents, and they had gone through Little League, Pop Warner football, and not me. I came from Golden Gate Park, you know, <laughs> pick up. Pick up games. <laughs> yeah, so so before the first game, I, uh, I, I resigned. I quit the you know, freshman football team and focused on my studies. I lived in my mother's uh, apartment for just a short time, and then I started hanging out with Stephanie. My clothes, a lot of my clothes were in San Francisco with my brother, but I was in Berkeley ah. with her, okay. with college people and, you know, doing college stuff. I was not a Fillmore Street or Divisadero Street kid anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went on, we got married, and uh, um, I got a job. Uh, I got out of San Francisco State. I got a job at K... Uh, Okay, so well down in San Mateo. And what was your major at San Francisco State, though? What did you get a degree in? I got a degree in radio and TV production, minored in journalism. So that uh, that uh, led you to the radio stations then? I was the most sought-after director in my class. So this one kid, he sought me out to do a, a production that he had written. He was a writer. Mm -hmm. Another kid was a producer who actually worked for ABC Sports, but he was getting his degree there. And they came to me with this project to direct. So I directed it. Um, it was a 30-minute soap opera kind of thing, I think it was. And so 
This kid that wrote that, his name is Peter Casey. Mm. Peter Casey went on to write and produce for the Jeffersons, Cheers, Wings, and, and other and other TV <laughs> multimillionaire. You didn't think Multi about calling Peter Casey and reminding him of who his first producer was. He knew he knew who I was. Peter and I stayed friends for a long time. I went to see him in L.A. as a struggling student. Uh, Peter would uh, Peter went to uh, I think a Rose Bowl with us. We took him to, through Stephanie. Uh -huh. Took him to a Rose Bowl with us and let him see the game and all that. We were we were like family. Uh, I knew his mom well and visited uh, with them in in uh, in, uh, in Marin County, Sonoma, where his mom lived. So when when we graduated, um, I wanted to be a director, but I didn't want to go to Fresno or whatever and leave Stephanie or drag her with me. You know, trying to work my way up. So. My counselor said, you know, John, you'd be a great salesman. I'm going to hook you up with this guy at KPIX and sales to learn the sales game. Terrible choice. <laughs> I'd, I'd go to KPIX to meet the guy. Sometimes he'd be there. Sometimes he wouldn't. Uh, when he was there, I didn't learn anything from him. He showed me nothing. Um, it was nice to get inside the studio to see the place, but I got I learned absolutely nothing from that experience. Mm. So when I got out, somehow I did an interview or something at KSOL Radio. Uh, they were just kind of getting started. They hired me. They hired me and they hired a guy from San Jose. I had half the sales accounts and he had the other half. I had accounts like Bill Graham, Presents, and all these others. You couldn't hear the radio station outside two blocks of where we were broadcast. So I got a call from KCBS FM. Whoa, downtown San Francisco, 32nd floor. And so, of course, I, I left. The white general manager called me back and said, John, come back. Come, we're about to blow up. One of the biggest mistakes of my life. Really? And I stayed at KSOL. You would not be talking to me right now. They moved their tower to Twin Peaks in San Francisco. And when they did that, you could hear that signal everywhere. All I would have been doing then is answering the phone, writing contracts. Little did you know. Little did I know. I wound up at KCBS FM, which was KSOL. People would say, oh yeah, I know that station. <laughs> That's the news station. I'd go, no, it's the music station. <laughs> oh, what kind of music do they play? I said, oh, it's kind of easy rock. Mm -hmm. They said, okay. And I'd say, here, here's, here's, here's the station here. They couldn't hear it. <laughs> they couldn't hear it in certain parts of the Bay Area. So I left. I got a call from this lady. And I had met her just in the business, running around to radio stations and things. And she said... She said, John, they're interviewing people at Case at uh, CBS Records. They're opening up a new department in, uh, in, in the sales. Uh, so go down there, give them a call and get an interview. So I did. Um, I went, you know, went in my suit and tie. Yeah. Everybody else was in T-shirt and jeans. Because that was the attire of the music business for most of those guys because they were working in warehouses with records. Right. I got the job. Two reasons. I had a suit on and I was already employed by... A radio station. Yeah. That nobody could hear. Yes. <laughs> Kathy, I lasted one year. It was a meteor that burned out in that year. I walk in the door, they hand me an American Express card. They give me my own office at Stewart and Mission Street. Wow. My own in the office, Kathy. <laughs> a full. What do I need? A full bar. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, I was a. I, they gave me an American Express card. <laughs> they. How many concert tickets do you need for Santana at the Oakland Coliseum? Oh my. Uh, how about twenty-five? Five and I gave five out to the radio stations and I sold the other 20 <laughs> for profit. That's just for the Santana concert. 
I how many it. albums do you need uh, to promote the Santana's new album? Uh, how about 150? Okay. Kathy, 25 went to the radio stations. <laughs> Where did the other 125 go? <laughs> Don't know. Kathy, I had a brand new 320 IBMW. And it, it, it was, Kathy, it was ugly. Yes, ugly. <laughs> did they notice? Did they notice that you were getting no, a little out of hand? No, it was, it was, you know, they just come out of that payola phase where yeah. you were paying people straight up. Now you did favors, mm -hmm. which was kind of the same thing. Right. You know? So it was, it was kind of the business, but you had to be slick about it or whatever. But uh, I was there 30 days, and I'm at a convention in London. Who's the dinner, the dinner entertainment? Oh, how about the Beach Boys? How about Santana? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was it was just crazy. On and so during the day, I go to radio stations and take people like uh, I visited the radio stations. It's only four. Or I could go to Monterey and get a room at the Hyatt or whatever state at Monterey. Come on, you could do that in a day, go back to Oakland. Nah, I'm going to stay, spend the night, and I got to go down to Monterey. That's as far, I think, south as I went. I didn't go very far north. There's no radio station. No. <laughs> the only three or four, KSFX, KSOL, KCB. Uh, I, I even started doing K-Jazz. I broke some records at K-Jazz even. Remember KRE? No. KRE, what okay, was KRE, KRE was over in Berkeley, uh, off of Ashby. Okay. And then just around the corner was KDIA, also on the bay over there. Yeah, KRE was an FM station, and I'd go over there sometimes and hang out at night with the DJ, and you know, have a drink with them or smoke a joint or whatever it took mm -hmm. to get some records played. Some play. because. The, because you know, you know what top forty means, right? Yes. That means only forty records are being played all the time. Right, right. Right. So I'm with CBS, which has the Columbia label, the Philly International label, uh, and Epic. Mm. I've got I've got Teddy Pendergrass. I've got Peter Tosh. I've got Michael Jackson, I've got the Jacksons, I've got the Isley Brothers, I've got Lou Rawls, 40 slots. Yeah. What about the other companies? They want their records played in KDIA, too. <laughs> I got Santana. I got Heat Wave coming out with a breakup. How do I get them played? How do I get them started? Well, I go to KJ's, and I smoke a joint with them and do some things with them. The next thing I know, they're playing Always and Forever. <laughs> They're talking about heat wave, and next thing you know, you flip it over, and you got Boogie Nights. <laughs> Same thing at KRE. Let's let's play. You know, it's a jazz, it's a jazz FM station. I said, hey man, you know, K Jazz is playing Always and Forever. It's a great love song. You know, check it out. So they play it at midnight, one two o'clock in the morning. Next thing you know, they're playing it during the day. <laughs> next thing you know, KDIA is playing it. In the meantime. Stephanie and I are traveling the whole time. Oh, well, this is, and you've got all this money, from, too, from so you're, one. where are you from going? Day one, we started in college doing uh, uh, doing the Rose Bowl and Super Bowl during our Christmas breaks. So were you were you doing it as uh, just a couple, or were you taking other people? Were you putting together trips? We were, we were doing it, we were doing it as a couple. Um, first of all, we were poor. Uh, we wanted to travel, and we'd take the kids. But what they had, what was called familiarization trips. Yes. If if the Hilton was opening a new hotel in Hawaii, they'd want the travel agents to come and check it out. Mm -hmm. So we'd only have to pay for airfare. Right. And we right. went to Jamaica a lot. Yeah. I stopped counting at 20 visits. <laughs> Stephanie <laughs> went at least 20 times. I think our first visit was 78. We took a group to Reggae Sunsplash. I still have the T-shirt. The T-shirt is about that big now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can stretch it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the original T-shirt, Reggae Sunsplash. We did that. And so uh, a lot of trips I would accompany her on, and then a lot, uh, a few of I me mean, was 
for her business, and, and I didn't. But we, we traveled together almost from day one. Mm. But in between there, you had worked as a doorman for Sheraton? I, went to, I worked for High, and I got a job leaving CBS Records. I went to City College and got a degree in culinary. Okay. I had this vision of, I had just had my daughter. I said to myself, you know, the Bay Area is a tourist place. There's a bunch of hotels and restaurants in the Bay Area. You'll never be out of work. <laughs> So I went to City College and got a degree. The way to get in the door is internship. So I chose to intern at the Hyatt in downtown Oakland. A black man in a black town in a nice hotel. <laughs> Easy. I blend right in. We had a black general manager who was clean, sharp, Hollywood type guy. Mm -hmm. I outdressed him. I outshone him. Why? I wanted to be the shiny dime so that when the internship ended, they created a position for me at the end of my internship, uh, cafe supervisor. I went from cafe supervisor to uh, assistant room service manager to room service manager to assistant banquet manager. Before I left, I was there for six years. Before I left there, they offered me the job of uh, room service manager in Puerto Rico at Dorado Resort. Now that's going from uh, 300 rooms in Oakland to 3,000 in Dorado. No thank you. <laughs> Had I con continued on that track, I would have I would have been a, uh, a general manager for Hyatt within another six years. It's true. But, but I, uh-uh. Do you think it was just a lack of information? I mean, a lack of... Not because Again, we... if had I had I had a mentor, yeah. maybe so. Yeah. But but it's always me making the best decisions for myself because I don't know anybody above me right. in the hotel business. I don't know any black men yeah. in San Francisco that I could go to mm -hmm. that have done it or you know uh, anywhere. So I'm making the best decisions for me and the family. So I got the next promotion to be assistant banquet manager. The banquet manager leaves, and now I'm the banquet manager. And the economy and everything, they're going through bad times. And I got my butt whipped. I would be there. I'd be the first one there at 6.30, 6 in the morning, and I'd be the last to leave at midnight. And the employees were making, the waiters were making more money than me. Oh, my. So that, that $20,000, $21,000 a year, was like 85 cents an hour. You know, that was no money. No. <laughs> so um, I left there and worked at a couple of smaller hotels in the area, Clarion and uh, Hyatt or something, some of these. Uh, then I, I had worked in security in hotels, too, while I was at San Francisco State. That was my, uh, I ran into Demi Moore. They're, they were doing a movie in San Francisco. Demi Moore comes in one night drunk. <laughs> from partying and, and the whole time to escort her to her room. Um, but so um, I got a job as um, doorman at the Hyatt, my second stint at the Hyatt, I got a doorman job. Mm -hmm. Loved it, worked there for six years, and then I got a job, listening to my cousin, got a job, well, I had an opportunity to work in the city and county of San Francisco as a bus driver. The guy, he was retired, uh, San Francisco policeman. He was working there in security. And he was a nice guy, and I, and I used him for counsel. And he said, John, anytime you have a chance to go to work the city and county of San Francisco, you do it. Yeah. Hyatt didn't have a real uh, uh, good uh, uh, retirement plan that I knew of. So I said, hey, I'm going to take a chance driving a bus in San Francisco and work for city and county of San Francisco. So that's what I did. Had you ever driven and, anything that large before? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I had I had driven vehicles in the, the military. Did you have a Two license to drive that? Don't they have a special license for those? When you drive Muni, they train you. I see. It's they, all it's all done in house. I see. Okay. Yeah, for that it's it's done in house because you've got to learn to drive. Uh, a bus that's on a wire, on a pole. Yes. That can only go so far. And it, it's all positioning and angles. Okay. 
you know. Yeah, uh, but, but you got to have some awareness about other people driving. Especially in San Francisco. Yeah, especially in San that, and that, You know, I drove everything except co- cable cars because I, they're too prone to accidents. The electric trains, like the bar trains, and those cable cars are so accident prone because you cannot stop on a dime. That's what I would think, yeah. You just can't stop them. And people are so crazy, Kathy. They will sacrifice their new Mercedes. They're so enraged. A guy hit me with his car at Sutter and Kearney, trying to make a left turn on Sutter. Hit his Mercedes. He waved to me and said, don't worry about it. That's okay. And kept going. <laughs> so it's in such a hurry to go somewhere. So, yeah, I, it, it was too nerve-wracking. So, that's yeah, that's how I wound up at... Uh, how long did you work with him? 13 years. 13, okay. Yeah. Had an accident. Two guys said that I hit them on uh, uh, on Ocean Avenue. People acted as though I'd actually run over two guys with an electric train on Ocean Avenue. Didn't see that in the newspaper, did you? No. Didn't, didn't see that story, did you? Because <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> but but then here, here here comes the spirituality. I didn't hit them. Um, Never should have been fired, but, you know, I was a guy that they were paying a lot of money, $30, $30 an hour, and Muni was trying to get rid of all of the, the uh, $30 an hour guys and start with these 12 to 18 hour uh, an hour guys. Uh-huh. Stephanie is so beautiful. When I went and told her that I was fired, she was sad, Kathy, for about 90 seconds. <laughs> and then she says, oh, well. We'll work it out. We'll make it work. I never went back to work for anybody. I did more in retirement <laughs> than I did working for anybody. I don't know how or what happened, but it, I just it just did. And um, it's been it's been you know great since then. Uh, Stephanie retired. First thing we did is I took Stephanie to Fry's Electronics. <laughs> and I said, pick out your computer. Find a nice computer that you want. This is your computer. <laughs> You're going to hook her up. <laughs> she got a computer. She came home. Of course, she's always done the you know family finances and all that. And next thing you know, she's booking people on tours. And it's, we've got this group of people now. This guy came up to her, John Robinson came up to us, and he said, you know, you know you got to follow him. <laughs> John said, you know, there are certain people who expect certain things, who have means, and they like what you're doing, they like your professionalism. And so basically he was saying, you're stuck with us. <laughs> <laughs> We've got we've got three on the books right now that were that she's working on in spite of the pandemic. Yeah, I saw I got something from her about Fiji. Is that is that one of them? Got Fiji is is up and running, been up and running. Uh, Europe, Italy, uh, that's up and running, and Antarctica. Believe it or not, I believe it. She just had some uh, updated flyers up put out on the uh, the web page website. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she's just just knocking it out. Um, I got a wedding this this Saturday. That's right. I wanted to I've ask you three. about your. Were you? Did you look, get into this wedding business because of your religion, or just because you thought it'd be interesting to do? Neither. <laughs> okay. Kathy, I tell you, some things are just are just spirit led. It's just the spirit leads you. Um, it's some stuff that you've kind of been preparing for all your life and you don't even know about it. Mm. Uh, Pat asked me to take over the security on the ship, blended in my hotel and restaurant uh, skills with my security skills that I had and organization and communication. I didn't, when I went to San Francisco State and City College, I didn't know that was all coming together 20 years later. <laughs> no. But it did, so I did that for 18 years. And then she wanted me to do the religious uh, program. Oh, Pat asked you to do that. Pat asked me to do that. To put the because ch- I know we had church on Sunday morning. 
Yeah. Choir in the whole band. I didn't say, hey, can I do this? <laughs> I don't know. You might have been at the first one we had. We had those 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 twin brothers that traveled with us. Yes, they own the they own the McDonald's and uh, McDonald's, on the East Coast. Yeah, yes, I was on that trip. Yeah, they were they were uh, deacons or something. And I don't even know what we had, some kind of tape recorder or something for music or whatever. <laughs> but that's how we started. And next thing I know, we got choirs. We got full programs. I was in several of those choirs. Yeah, we got choirs. We got a pianist. We got a choir director. <laughs> but that's, that's just, you know, John, you know, being in the church from the age of birth. And knowing what a church program looks like and feels like, and and what you know, yeah, be, be, then being ordained a deacon later on, and then just on and on and on. So when you say, "Are you doing weddings because it was something you just wanted to do?" in, in a little bit, yeah, a little bit, but uh, spirit led stuff, um, and, and that's been happening a lot. But yeah, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit prepares you for certain things in life. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, be, I'm, I'm recognizing that and acknowledging that and following that, and, and it's okay, you know, uh, because it's not all me. I'm not that smart or that intuitive. But we were uh, we were doing our life group on Sunday, and as the leader. Um, I, I challenged the group. I said, you know what? I think this is a good group and we've done enough. I don't think we have. I think we should do something else, something more uh, in the way of service. One of the ladies says, I got a project we can do. And I said, what is it? She says, well, what we're doing at the hospital, we're collecting items for kids who are coming out of foster care and going into their on their own and furnishing their own apartments. They jumped all over that idea. <laughs> and I said, now see what you guys just did. One of the women in the group, before we could even get off the call, came up with an idea. You guys ate it up, and you're loving it. And they filled that bin up within a day. Oh, my. <laughs> and I said, you know what? We should have done one bin per couple. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, because we are hoarders. I'm, 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 but again, I'm sitting there and the Holy Spirit challenged me to challenge them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can, I can say this. In fact, I was saying this to my husband this evening. I said, uh, uh, it's obvious that you're both religious, that you, you believe in God, and it's real clear. But you don't wear it on your sleeve, and you live by it every day. And yeah. that has been, that's probably why you are, are so loved because they can see the love coming from you. Yeah, well, that's, that's good, and that's, that's who we are at our core, but we've learned uh, through our studies that that's really what Christian people are supposed to be. They're supposed to be humble people. Yeah. They're supposed to be winning <laughs> souls for Christ, and how can you win souls for Christ if you're turning people off? Why would you want to ask someone like that for advice? Right. Why would you trust someone? It's remarkable, Kathy, that to me, the people that will call me that you don't know about, that you don't expect will call. Uh, you know, I see you and Stephanie on Facebook. You've been married for 20 years, and you did this and that. Can you? I got a problem. Can you give me a, Can you give me some advice? No, no. Well, you know, we struggled, and 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 uh, you know, overcome it again. God put us through things, all kinds of things. I'm an expert on everything, Kathy. As a result of what I've done in my life, I can tell you about everything. First hand knowledge, I tell you, I know it all. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. but 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 you know, I think not only did you just survive it because uh, you're a good person, I also think you're a highly intelligent guy who didn't know how smart he was. Maybe yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. I don't think you understood I don't think you had any any inkling how intelligent you were. It's one thing to be smart, but it's another yeah. to be intelligent. This this instructor at John Adams, when I came out of the army, and I was at John Adams. I was in a literature class, and the and the instructor came up to me and he says, he bent over to my. He says, "You're an intellectual." I didn't think, what is that? 
We don't have we don't have the intellectuals in the hood. When I was in San Francisco State, just getting started, there was a program at, at uh, San Francisco State that helped veterans get into college by, you know, by uh, improving their test taking. Uh-huh. So, Kathy, I was an instructor at the San Francisco Presidio at the night school in 20th century literature. <laughs> now, slap Al with that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching Faulkner and... Him? Hemingway, oh, yeah, oh, I love those guys. Yeah, love the work, love the work. And I was, I was teaching. I was, I was teaching with a, uh, another lady. She was teaching math, I think, and I was teaching uh, and getting paid, Kathy. So you put hard work and intelligence, intelligence together, and you get something done. You really will. Yeah. 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 So I, I mean, and then, then uh, today, I'm, I'm here. I am still learning. I'm in seminary. What seminary what, school? What, Seminary school, yeah, why? I don't know. I don't know. You know, when my dad was alive, he was a preacher, pastor, had his own church in San Francisco. He would have me read passages to him because uh, I was a good reader. Yeah. And I was the oldest, and, you know, so I'd sit with him. And I think, Kathy, that he was always, he was preparing me for ministry. Mm. Because I think he could read, but he would pretend he couldn't read or, or he didn't want to read. He wanted me to read it to him. But he would then say, what does that mean? Yes, he was preparing you. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Making you think beyond the words. I'm, I'm, I'm a cook. I'm a dishwasher. I'm from the South. I don't really know. You're, you're born and raised in San Francisco. You go to these good schools. You're educated. You speak well. You read well. What does that mean? Okay, Daddy, this is what I think it means. Yeah, and then he, he died at 50. Leukemia. Oh. And uh, I was cut loose, rudderless. But I, I kind of found my way back. Yeah. Because we we still stayed in church because I love church. I love I love church, especially the black church with the music and yeah. the spirit. And all. I love it. But I wasn't as committed. We went, we continued to go because my mother was still going and um, I'm always faithful and loving and, 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 and everything to my mom mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. until she died. So we supported her and her pastor husband, Reverend Leach. We love Reverend Leach. Mm-hmm. Reverend Leach preached until he was 90-something, falling out of the pulpit. <laughs> the seminary is just a curiosity. I don't know where it's going to lead, but I'm always in leadership. I'm leading, I've been leading this life group for five years. Um, I was an ordained deacon. So... It's kind of good to know what you're talking about. If you're yeah. talking about the Word of God and the Bible, it's kind of good to not just wing it or what you think. It's kind of good to know. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I understand you're the Uber driver for your neighborhood. Is that still a fact? Uh, people call me the Uber driver here because I was doing Uber. I, I took a guy on a medical appointment. My wife will, will pick me up. You know, she'll, she'll leave work and pick me up. And I said, well, you know, for another $10 or 5 or $10, I'll, I'll take you back home. You know, come yeah. on, we're retired. And nobody's going anywhere. He says, that sounds, let me ask her. And he said, that sounds, so he says, yeah, you can do that. I take him to the hospital. I take him to his appointment. He gets back in the car and he says, you know what? My blood pressure has been the lowest it's ever been. He says, it's probably because you drove me down here and not my wife. <laughs> so I started taking him, and then my, uh, my mortgage guy who lives here asked me to take him to the airport because I drove Uber. But you can't request me through Uber. Right. So um, I'm sitting out in front of his house. We're about to leave. A neighbor comes up and says, hey, Luis, where are you going? John's taking us to the airport. And he says, oh, really? John, will you take me to the airport? I'm going next week. So all of a sudden, (laughs) this word of mouth gets going around. And then Stephanie starts doing a few things for travel-related things for some folks here. (laughs) Like uh, booking some people. These ladies were going to, four of them were going to fly out of Sacramento 
to San Francisco and then take a cab downtown to the pier, to the ferry building and get on a boat. Well, no. Why don't the four of you get in John's car <laughs> and drive directly to the pier? Right. Oh, this was Stephanie oh. setting this up, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they said, that makes a lot of sense. So I packed those four ladies in the Cadillac and their, and their stuff and drove them directly to San Francisco. And I, and I have since done other people, you know, pick up and drop off San Francisco and Oakland. Uh-huh. In addition now to uh, uh, Sacramento Airport. So now I, I've done uh, wine uh, tours. I've done medical. And while we were going in Africa uh, last year at this time, I was gone for maybe 10 days or something like that. I needed two guys. To do your in. job? To do, to do yeah, what you... To fill in. I, I, people are booking again already now. <laughs> yeah, just... They, they're getting it in shots, and they want to get out. But I don't want to be too successful, because then I'm not retired anymore. That's right. <laughs> you know. Well, John, but, yeah, that's, that's, if that's you had I to give it. yourself a title, what would you call yourself? Renaissance Man. Renaissance Man. Oh, that's, that's a good one. So the Renaissance Man of... What do you think you are the master of, though? What do you think you're best at? Oh, I guess um, at this point, at this point, counseling. Okay. Counseling and advising, life, life coach, almost they call it nowadays. Do you do? I don't know. Do you ever meet anyone uh, and act as if they're a stranger? As if they are. There's, there's a connection there somewhere. Mm-hmm. There's a connection there, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. You look for the commonality between you and the individual. The connecting point, yeah. And see, that, that shows that you're constantly reading and finding that point. And, that's, and when you find it, it's almost like instantaneous. Well, it's good. It, it, it comes in handy with the marriage business, that talking to couples. Because um, a lot of them, well, the majority of them are younger than I am. Yeah. They look at the fire. They look at the fire. They know it's a fire. And what do they do, Kathy? Jump in the fire. <laughs> Stick their hand in the fire anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then tell you I burned myself. <laughs> right. Well, I'm sorry you had to burn. It's not for, to manipulate you. Right. I'm not using your feelings to manipulate. No, I'm telling you, it may it may take a while for it to sit in. You know, that, that seasoning in that gumbo might take a couple of days, but boy, once it hits, you got something. Yeah. You might not realize it when you're shaking it. I'm kind of excited and a little scared about where this next door is going to open. <laughs> <laughs> What's behind that next door? Well, you know that, you know, I'm, I'm gathering all of this information, all these interviews, uh, because I think. Um, there's a history that we all have shared and nobody else, nobody knows we're even here. Uh, because mm -hmm. most of the time, uh, the story that we get is very similar to the one you told me about your brothers. That's what black life is. And yeah. what I think I heard from you is that there is redemption. Because another path was laid out to you and you took it for the good. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think having children... And, and wanting the best for them, and being a responsible father, kept me, you know, kept me straight as well. It's a, it's a struggle though. But the life is, life is tough. Life can be pretty crazy. Don't relax and think that you got it made because you don't. You could slip any time. I met some very famous people. Sarah Vaughn, O.J. Simpson, Stan Getz, Red Fox. Happy Lincoln. You I sure could write a book, Kathy. <laughs> I could write a book. I got Mick Jagger in London. Yeah. CBS Records convention. I was complaining that how come you know black music marketing? We're black music marketing. How come we're not doing anything? How come we don't have a party? All these other guys, okay, John, put a party together. Put storeroom guys was there from San Francisco with me. 
We're in the ballroom. We're trying to set the stuff up. And I'm playing music. It's not CBS Records music. This guy, I'm in London, England, Kathy. Right, right. The door opens. This guy hears the music. He comes skipping up, down the, next to the wall. He skips in front of me and skips away and back out of the room. <laughs> now, you know you can tell Mick Jagger's profile yeah. anywhere. Yes. Mick Jagger came in, skipped through the room, and left. <laughs> Teddy Pendergrass. He's in San Francisco with me. We've got a new album coming out. And so we're doing KRE. I take Teddy Pendergrass to KDIA, which is on the Oakland side. I take him to KRE, which is a half a mile swing around there on the, on the bay there. So we're about to go to San Francisco for KSFX for the interview. He says, wait a minute me i gotta i gotta meet these people i said that's cool my house is nearby we'll just go to my house and have them come there we're in a limo and i'm on this small dead end street <laughs> these these two women and a man come to my house kathy to meet teddy pendergrass i have never seen so much cocaine in my life <sighs> yeah, yeah. But that, that, those are teddy's friends and that's what teddy wanted and you kept your mouth shut and that's it I'm with Peter Tosh on uh, Sutter and uh, Sutter and, and Kearney at the, I think KSFX was uh, the station. Peter Tosh wants to smoke a joint right there on <laughs> Kearney and Sutter, and he does. And he does. And he does. Yeah, who's to stop him? I'm Peter Tosh. <laughs> get in the car. Will you put that thing out? Get in the car. <laughs> get in the car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. So. I, yeah, and I, like I said, I was like a meteor mm. that burned out in that in one year. But because you're at the radio stations during the day trying to get records played, and then at night you're at concerts, mm. either meeting the artist backstage or attending. Minnie Riverton, I met her uh, at her. She had her dressing room set up like a a, a living room <laughs> for her daughter and her husband. That it wasn't a dressing room where people came in and the public came in. No. I'll talk to you at the door. But yeah. I met her. I talked uh -huh. to her. Richard Pryor. Oh, my. So my friend asked me if I wanted to go. So Stephanie and I went to the Richard Pryor concert with uh, Vaughn Thomas and uh, Sheila Frazier. <laughs> and then so we went backstage to see Richard. And Richard loved Sheila Frazier. They were good friends. But Richard was such a nice guy. Really? Oh, he was nice. Oh, he was the sweetest guy. So we went, he said, you guys want to come over to the room? Come on over to the room. Now, we know Richard's reputation. <laughs> and Stephanie and I are pretty conservative, but, you know, we, you know, we, we, we can still handle ourselves. Yes. Yeah. So we said, yeah, we'll go over there. So we get over there. We get in the elevator. We go up, the four of us up the elevator. Elevator opens. Uh, Vaughn gets out. Sheila gets out. We get out of the elevator. We go in and we go to his room. And we're sitting there. We're having drinks. And we're just having you know, just conversation. But, you know, this is after the concert, so it's yeah. like 12, maybe 12.30, maybe 1 o'clock. I, mean, I think about 1.30, 1 1.45, there's a knock on Richard's door, and those people show up. <laughs> I don't know, one or two women and this one guy who looked like a bodybuilder, but he sounded like Minnie Ripperton. And they went and they went upstairs. There was a loft, an open area loft type uh, format to the room, and so we could hear the voices upstairs. Yeah. I said, Stephanie, it's time to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we said good night. Nice talking to you. Nice meeting you guys. <laughs> but don't you find that uh, those some of those people are some of the loneliest people in the world? I, I understand, you know, that gave me an understanding, Kathy, seeing those people behind the scenes, up close and personal. I don't understand, or I do understand, why those marriages don't ever work out. Ball players, yeah. celebrities, hey, no. Well, I have to thank you so much for uh, supporting my little project here. And, uh, well, Jack it's... of all trades, master of none. <laughs> <laughs> It popped, it popped in. Because I've been thinking the same thing hours ago.
Jack of all trades. And then you brought it up. That's why I was still stuck. But yeah. I was thinking about it. Well, there you go. Well, I think it fits you. I think it fits you well. Don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I, I'm not a master of anything. Thank you, John, for your candid sharing of your spirit-led life and aspirations. You went from hotel management, muni driver, doorman, art procurement, Uber driver, and excelled at everything you chose. Because of your willingness to learn, faith in yourself and God, you persevered. You call yourself the Renaissance Man, I believe that John Spears is an intellectual with style, an unconscious entrepreneur, a seeker of experiences beyond himself. Most importantly to me, I call him and his wife Stephanie my friends. Thank you, John, and thank you for listening.